run. I'm going to do this in English. I um, uh, hope that's okay with everyone. Uh, oh. Uh, <laughs> um, glad some of you made it through the day and stayed to listen to me. Um, so I'm going to talk about WordPress threats. I originally named it WordPress security, but then someone at my company said, that's a really boring name. So we came up with this instead. I think it's okay. Um, first, a little bit about who I am. Uh, I'm Swedish. I actually grew up here in Stockholm, but I work for an American company who uh, makes the security plugin WordFence, which some of you may be familiar with. How many people in here know that? Okay, great. More than half. That's super. We also have a new service that we just launched this year that we're still working on, but it's live. Uh, it's a gravity scan. It's a vulnerability scanner. It also scans for malware and some other stuff. But WordFence is our biggest, well, most well-known product so far. And why am I doing this then? Um, I started on the security track because I was working as a developer, and I started looking through my access logs. Uh, Everybody, anybody in here know what an access log is? Yeah, okay, I'm going to tell you then. <laughs> uh, on a web server, which is where you host your website, um, there are a bunch of logs that are automatically generated. The access log is a log that logs all traffic that on your site. So whenever anyone visits it, it'll make one entry or several entries, depending on what they're doing. Uh, and if you look at an access log, then you can s you'll start seeing a bunch of strange things that you immediately can tell that these are not normal visitors. These aren't normal people visiting your website. They're requesting pages that don't exist, that have strange names. They're querying for a bunch of yeah, just fishy stuff. And when I started digging into that, that's when I realized that a very large part of all the traffic on my site was just bots looking for security holes. And that's how I started uh, digging into this. And eventually, I ended up at WordFence. And I work there right now with mostly with support, some little bit of a quality assurance, and some other tasks, but mostly in support. Um, WordFence has one, uh, a bunch of features. I just want to mention one because it's relevant to the validity of my talk. And uh, we have something called the WordFence Security Network, which you can participate in. And basically, what you're doing then is that you agree to send some of your uh, at the attacks that are made on your site. Those are shared with us. And in turn, you get some aggregate data back that protects your site. But this is pretty cool because it allows us to monitor malicious traffic on WordPress websites all over the world. Uh, everywhere WordFence is installed and you have selected to participate, we will be uh, reading some of that attack data, which gives us tons and tons of data <laughs> that we can analyze and see what the, what's currently happening with attacks. Like, what are the hackers actually trying to do right now? Uh, so that's what my some of the data that I'm using in my talk. And when I'm drawing conclusions, I'm drawing conclusions on based on that data. Uh, first of all, why? Why are sites attacked? Uh, often when I talk to people who have just like a blog or you know, they're not that super into web development and stuff like that, they'll say, oh, I'm safe because I just have this tiny little site. Nobody cares about that. Nobody's going to attack that. Okay, that's not how it works. How it works is that you have uh, botnets and bots uh, uh, searching on the internet for WordPress sites, testing various types of exploits. All this is automatic, and they don't care if you have a you know, a little workshop website, a knitting website, or whatever you have. As long as it's WordPress, they're happy because they can look for, they know what to look for. Um, and this is the reason why this would ha it happens like this is because uh, open source software has, a p in my opinion, uh, pros and cons. I hear that my <laughs> hearing is like making noise. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Um, so it's really cool with open source because we all know the code, which means we can all share uh, the code and we can contribute to the code. The downside is that the code is open also to hackers to see and look through and find holes in. Um, so that's why that's the main reason why WordPress is targeted because uh, you know how to target it. Um, Oh yeah, I was supposed to say why. <laughs> uh, so SEO spam is one uh, huge thing. Um, anyone here work with SEO? Yeah, can you guys know what SEO spam is then? It, you don't have a mic, so I'm gonna have to tell everyone. <laughs> uh, SEO spam is when you put um, 
content on a website that will uh, cause Google to count that into rankings, but you're putting it illegitimately. So it's not actually a real content of the website. You're often like injecting it. For example, you could have in the footer of a website that could be like, Adidas Nike shoes, but this is actually like a website about cars. How did that appear? Well, maybe the site was hacked and it was injected. So that's what I mean with SEO spam. And why would you do that? Because you want to increase the ranking of your own sites. And you can use the other sites' credibility and to do that. Uh, advertisements, very simple uh, logic there. You put advertisements on someone else's page, you get uh, paid for every view. And one thing we don't often talk about, but that I've just started thinking about more lately, is that uh, because of a blog post by someone, <laughs> but anyways, uh, sites have uh, your sites, all of your guys' sites typically will have a really good reputation on Google and stuff like that. Um, so when you go to your websites, you won't get a big red warning that says malware, watch out for this site, because you guys are taking care of your sites. So. If your site is hacked, that's a great resource for hackers because they don't have that. They don't have sites with good reputation. So uh, they can use your site for phishing, for example, put up a fake Facebook login or a Spotify login or whatever they want to put up. And they won't get, people who visit your site won't get that warning because your site still has good reputation for a certain period of time until someone notices, then your reputation is gone. <laughs> you can also use, uh, take over sites to attack other sites. This is uh, not that common, I would say, but it does happen um, to use it to attack other sites. And the most uh, coolest hype thing ever right now, crypto mining. <laughs> it's just becoming like something that's actually a thing. It's been like a hype type of thing for a long time, but it, we haven't really seen it happening until now. And this, um, I'm sure you guys have heard of Bitcoin and stuff like that. Uh, so basically, these are scripts that will mine virtual currency. And if you put that on, like let's say I was able to put that on like the biggest Swedish newspaper's website, this means that every visitor to that website would be using, their computer resources would be, using, would be used to mine virtual currency for me. So that would be, uh, could be pretty lucrative. There are also two uh, hackers who do it for more what I call, these are monetary causes for hacking. These are social causes. So that would be fame. That's your classic like hacker stereotype who will, you know, hack stuff and put up screenshots and ooh, post on forums, stuff like that. And then there's also political propaganda, which is also fairly common. I would say it's, you know, these can also be mixed. It's not like this is one guy, that's one guy. They can be mixed. But I've divided them like this to make it a little bit easier to understand. Now we're going to look at a hacked site. Doesn't look so bad, does it? <laughs> so uh, the main thing I wanted to show here was that I don't know if you guys can see, but if you look at the, if you're looking at a hacked site, you will often see evidence in the browser console. So um, if there's one thing I would encourage, like regular website owners to get comfortable with looking at, it is the browser console, because you want to look and see that you are familiar with everything here. Does this correspond to a plugin that I have installed? Is this a script that I have, you know, if you start there and start learning a little bit, checking at these domains, you can learn quite a bit. Uh, but in this specific example, what we're seeing that they're doing is that they're loading a bunch of advertisements, YouTube videos, which I'm guessing they get ad revenue from the views. And uh, yeah, uh, the dumb thing here, and that is, you know, this is called defacement, is when you remove the whole actual website. It's not very common, actually. Uh, most hacks do not deface, and th that's because it's not very smart, because it, the website owner will immediately discover it, right, and do something about it. It's much smarter <laughs> if you hack a site in a secret way, in my opinion, at least. I don't hack sites, though, but I can still have opinions. <laughs> um, yeah, okay. So on that secret note, for example, like SEO spam that I was talking about before, 
that will often not be visible at all uh, when you go to your website. You, it will look just as normal. And often people don't notice until uh, it's very late in the process and their reputation is starting getting affected. So, but you should be able to, I haven't actually done that myself, but I'm thinking that whatever analytics you're using, you should be able to keep track of that. If you're starting to see weird stuff in your analytics, like all of a sudden you're ranking really good for like Nike, even though you have a, you know, like I said, a car business or something, then that would be definitely be a red flag. <laughs> All right, on the how, uh, the biggest how, most common how is this. Unfortunately, plugins, I love plugins. Plugins are super cool. There's tons of cool stuff. It's amazing what we've all built together. But when uh, uh, you're hacked, this is, this is where we're finding most hacked sites, unfortunately. And you also in themes, I would say these are maybe equal. I don't know, I see plugins more often, but themes also. And then eventually, sometimes, there will be a core vulnerability in WordPress core. Uh, on this note, I will say that it happens. At the same time, I want to say that compared to other CMSs, it's my humble opinion that WordPress is the most secure CMS out there. Uh, if you're looking at how often they get hacked, how often it gets security updates, et cetera, et cetera. So if I was choosing a CMS for security purposes, I would choose WordPress any day. Um, uh, fourth issue here on vulnerabilities is mistakes that you, your hosting or you yourself make. And when host, so, so, so when hosting makes mistakes, that's not very common, I would say, at least among the hosts that I know of in Sweden, but you know, we do see smaller hosts making mistakes sometimes. It's a, and that's that they don't isolate the customer accounts in a proper way. I won't go into the technical details, but uh, a good hosting company always should isolate each uh, customer's account so that it's not possible to get, get to the file system or the database of other accounts. It sounds like common sense, but sometimes mistakes are made. Uh, so sometimes we do see sites that are hacked because a site on the same server is hacked, and that's very <laughs> bad. But um, you as your site owner could also make mistakes. One thing we saw, I was actually gonna give an example here. See how much time I have. All the time in the world. Okay, 15 minutes again. I only have half an hour, I think. Oh, Jesus Christ. We're not even anywhere near the end. Um, okay, I'll just uh, skip that example. <laughs> um, oh yeah, I'll take this one, because it's really useful to think about. Uh, something we saw a lot, especially this summer, start of the spring, was a script called Search and Replace DB2. It was a ma maintenance script used for the database to like, replace stuff in your database, and people were downloading this, they were being encouraged by hosts to download this and fix stuff on the, their, their own. Oh, great, that's uh, super great that they were doing that, but everyone forgot to remove it, uh, and then uh, hackers started noticing this, so they're scanning sites for this specific URL, search and replace DB2, and finding them, and as soon as they find the file, they have full access to your database because there's no authentication on that script. So we got tons of hacked sites coming in just because you'd left that file behind. And uh, I'll mention also, since I was talking to someone outside, another mistake you'll make is you put up a WordPress test site, like you have a hosting account and you're like, oh, I want to test something, so you put up uh, my test site and then uh, you're like, oh, I'm gonna remove it later, but then, oh, it's dinner time and you forget about it and it lays there and it doesn't get updated and then it gets hacked. And once that site's hacked, all of the sites on your hosting account are gonna be hacked. So that's also a pretty common mistake. Second way how to get hacked. Uh, is brute force. Really simple type of attack, really uh, the simplest <laughs> thing you could think of. Just find the URL to a WordPress site. You ha try a, a combination of usernames and passwords. These are not typically like someone sits and invents them. They download um, huge catalogs of user usernames and password. They, and they, those catalogs come from previous hacks often, like if when Yahoo gets hacked and those big sites, all of those p username password combinations go out on the, the dark web. <laughs> um, and then you can download those and run those in a program and just test, test, test. Um, you know, if you're using a complicated password, you're not m very much at risk here. There are a few things that you want to uh, do. I'll talk about that later. Um, but at the same time, if you do this kind of attack, it doesn't take a long time before you find a site like this. Maybe it's one of those test sites that someone set up and they use test to test, username, password. Um, 
third one I want to talk about is actually a pretty interesting one. This is one is kind of new to me. I haven't been working with security for that long, so some people might call me a noob. But uh, <laughs> supply chain attacks is something that uh, I've just recently started uh, learning about. And what happened was that last year in 2016, uh, we discovered a plugin that had some bad code in it, and it was really bad. It was basically loading a file from a remote server, and what that's called is a backdoor, because it means that whoever's running that plugin can put whatever they want on your site. Um, and we were pretty horrified and everything, but the plugin author apologized, and he said, oh, I just gave uh, access to my plugin to the wrong people. And then time passed, and then this summer, 2017, Another plugin was pulled from the repository, WordPress.org plugin repository. And we looked at it, and whoops, we found the same code. It was really similar. Uh, and now we're getting like, whoa, dude, kind of feeling, because <laughs> this is the same code found in two different plugins. And then we start searching for that code in the repository and other places, and we start contacting plugin owners where we find that code. And we basically unravel a whole, like, totally crazy uh, criminal, in my opinion, story, where a specific guy and possibly a couple of accomplices have been contacting plugin authors um, either to pay them to get access to commit code to their plugin. Commit code is like when you're sending stuff up to the WordPress.org website, um, where everyone downloads it from. Um, or to buy their plugin with a bunch of, you know, sweet talk, like, uh, among the words were like, oh, I know it's so hard to be a plugin developer these days. I'll take all the work off your hands, you know, and I'll take such good care of your plugin for, and I'll pay you whatever, $15,000 or something. It wasn't like really small money, it was kind of big money. And then plugin authors who maybe are overworked, they're working for free, they haven't figured out a way to monetize their plugin, so they might be working like 20, 30 hours free every week. When they get that, I can sort of understand how you would even if you don't really believe it, seems too good to be true, maybe you kind of convince yourself because, geez, it would be nice to finally get paid for all this work, huh? So, it, in various ways, he had gotten access to these plugins, and he in it, in it, the, the first thing he did when he got access to them was to put, put in code that loaded files from a, a server that he controlled. Then he sent that up. Everyone updates their plugin. So when everyone updates that plugin that they have installed, they get his spam on their website. This was hundreds of thousands of websites that all of a sudden had links to his porn, uh, loan, spam, all types of stuff that he was doing, uh, making money off of. So that's a pretty crazy one. Um, since I don't have a lot of time, I'll just skip a little bit. Um, let's see here. Oh, I got to do this one. Um, this is just coming from uh, our tech data. Uh, I did. Uh, I pulled out some information just because I was curious. Like most of the attacks do not come from Sweden, to, to be clear, because um, we're kind of a small country. And uh, I have a list here. It's just at, at the time I pulled this out, France, Ukraine, and the Netherlands were at the top of the attacking countries on the WordPress sites that we manage, or that we not manage, but that we uh, participate in the WordPress security network. So I pulled out from that data <coughs> attacks that are coming from Sweden. This is actually from January. Um, and as you can see, Telia, Comham, this is, this is who's attacking your guys' sites. <laughs> no, it's not actually a Telia, of course. This is uh, going to be, in the vast majority of cases, going to be infected home computers. So that's another thing you want to think about. Um, in general, we need to think about to keep, <laughs> to keep stay secure is actually our own computers, too. Um, yeah, so I actually contact these guys sometimes and send them an email and say, hey guys, you better check this out. Most of them actually do, so that's cool. Um, okay, before we end, we gotta get, oh yeah, hey, this is just a funny one. I pulled out the host names of some of the attacking ones and it, I don't know, I think it's a little bit funny because you see what a variety of, you know, your, your website's being attacked. You don't really expect it to be coming from like, it's actually coming from the Royal Library, you know? <laughs> Again, it's not the Royal Library that's attacking you. It's one of their computers, which is clearly infected. I mean, in some cases, there could be a person behind it. Like when I'm looking at, for example, Shalemes and Stif yeah, the boys that there, I'm starting to wonder if it possibly could be a person who's having a little bit of fun or something, testing something. <laughs> I don't know. But I don't think that there's a hack around Kaleftio Commune. I don't know. Maybe there is. You never know. <laughs> On to the final, most important stuff. How do we protect ourselves against all this 
crap. <laughs> uh, vulnerabilities. Uh, so for plugins and themes, I think you've probably heard this before. Use as few as possible because uh, every plugin you add adds attack surface to your site. So if you know, if you're, I would just, if people ask for numbers, if you have 10, I think you're okay. If you have 80, I'd say you're screwed. You're going to get hacked. I mean, that kind of makes sense when you think about it, right? Um, always update all of them. If you're having problems with the, uh, you're scared that stuff is going to break, you need to get another site, like a copy of your site that you're updating on first to test. Not updating is not an option. Uh, be careful when you select a plugin. Um, look at who developed it and what credentials they have if you can. There's tons of stuff you can look at. I won't go through everything here, but you can look at reviews. Of course, there's always going to be some grumpy people that like, it sucks, you know, and stuff like that. So you can't just, not one bad review isn't a good reason to not get a plugin, but you can still look at them and see, mostly see if the authors are like active and responding to reviews and stuff like that. That's probably, in my opinion, that's a good sign because that means that if they get a security vulnerability reported to them, then they're probably going to fix it pretty quickly if they're active. Um, old and upda outdated plugins. Uh, if something hasn't been updated in like six months, typically I would start getting pretty worried at that point because it means that it's not getting updated. And if there's a security problem, it's not going to get fixed. Um, and when I say remove, I mean remove, remove, remove. Like every file should be off your server. You don't want to have anything deactivated that you're no longer using. If you're not using it, it should go. Because there are vulnerabilities in plugins that can be exploited even if it's deactivated. So just get rid of all that attack surface, <laughs> all that code. Uh, you can consider a firewall. Um, uh, there was someone who earlier talk who said, don't install a security plugin. It doesn't help. OK, clearly I disagree, because <laughs> I think that whether you do it via plugin or some other way, I think a firewall that has at least some generic rules, like basic rules that will protect you against the most common, obvious types of attacks is a good idea. I unless you're like a server administrator who knows how to set up your own rules and stuff like that, that's cool. But I think security plugins are great for people who do not are not able to put all the security up by themselves, like on the server and stuff like that. So if you, yeah, that's my opinion. And again, use a good web host. Uh, for brute force, which is uh, logins, where they're lo logging in on your site, um, I'll just bring that up because it always comes up. Uh, rename your WordPress login pages, what everyone always says, like, the, that'll fix it all. No, 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 no. The only thing you've done now when you removed your login page is that uh, you've kind of made it hard to log into your site and you've kind of lost track of who's actually attacking you because it's not going to get logged anymore. So there's something called XML RPC, for example, which is another login interface. So you'd have to block that. And now we have the REST API, which is coming, which is also going to be have authenticated requests. How are you going to block that, etc.? I don't think that you can just remove one file and then you're safe. You have to either, well, what you have to do is you have to use a complex password if you don't know how to use complex password, I know there's some person in here who's still using like banana cake as a password. It, I mean, I did it myself until recently, but <laughs> you, if you don't know how to do you keep in track of all these, use a password manager. Like just, just get over it. Download a password manager, use it. You will never go back, I swear. Then you, all your passwords can be X, Y, X, X, blah, 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 whatever. And you're cool with that. Two-factor authentication is cool. It adds one layer of security, but the complex password is much more important, in my opinion. Sometimes it depends on how you're implementing this, of course. But limit the number of logins allowed is a good idea, uh, because when they're doing these testing username password combinations, they need a certain amount of, like every every attempt is a uh, cost something, a resource, and the more attempts they're able to do, the faster they can do it. If you limit per IP the number of logins allowed, they're going to run out of IPs or they're going to have to rotate their IPs. You're making it really, really difficult. And it, the difference if you could be that it might take, if you haven't limited, maybe it'll take six days for someone to get into your website. If you do limit it, it might take 60 years instead. That's the big difference as it can be. In. And then there are some services like F IP Blacklist that you can look into. If you can find those, those are pretty cool because they will block access to the whole uh, authentication interface based on what an IP has been doing on other sites. I'll, I'll put in a promo for <laughs> or, or like Blacklist there that actually uses that 
WordFence Security Network to see how IPs addresses are behaving. If they're behaving badly, we just block them completely. They can't even try. Um, supply chain attack. Yeah, I guess that'll be my final note here. Then two minutes. Um, I think this is a pretty interesting uh, thing, and it's kind of new to me, and it's a big conundrum, and I think we can all think about that, like especially people who work uh, with plugin development, theme development. Like, I, I have no idea how we would protect ourselves against this. The WordPress.org people who work with the plugin theme, of course, they, they work with this. They pull these plugins out as soon as they notice that someone has been hijacked or purchased illegally or something like uh, put bad code in. So they're working with that, but, th but they're basically you know, playing whack-a-mole with, you know, uh, here's one pop, here's one pop. My, uh, my thinking is like, how do we, uh, is there a way we could eliminate this at all? Like, I'm wondering like if it might be good if there was a public way of selling your plugin, maybe they would be less likely to sell it to a bad person if, it, if we had like some kind of visual channels, like a marketplace that could be monitored. I have no idea. These are just thoughts that I'm throwing out there. Um, it's a pretty complicated uh, situation when you have people who are maybe sometimes working a lot for free. And uh, maybe another way, for example, might be to help plugin developers figure out how to monetize, uh, make money off of their plugins. Because if they're making money, then they might not be as inclined to sell it to a bad actor. I am all out of time, guys. That's too bad. But uh, I hope you learned something. Yeah, thank you very much, awesome. Yeah.